thank you very much for coming along today for the launch of this Lowy Institute report, uh, Shifting Waters, China's New Passive Assertiveness in Asian Maritime Security, uh, by Ashley Townsend uh, in the middle and Rory Metcalf uh, on, the, uh, on your left. Um, now this marks the first formal bit of cooperation between the National Security College and the Lowy Institute for International Policy. Uh, of course, the Lowy Institute has an excellent reputation as uh, one of Australia's preeminent think tanks uh, on uh, international security affairs, uh, and it's a great honour for the NSC to be associated in a formal sense uh, with Lowy. Uh, that said, of course, many of us at the NSC are, in a sense, sort of Lowy alumnus. You could almost argue that there's a bit of a Lowy mafia within the NSC. Um, and we're delighted to, uh, to uh, continue this, uh, this affiliation. Um, before I introduce the speakers, uh, I think as it is customary, uh, we should acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting today uh, and to pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Uh, now, folks, uh, I should begin by introducing uh, the head of the NSC, Professor Rory Medcalf. Um, who has, as many of you know, had a long and varied career uh, at the forefront of uh, Australia's national interest, the forefront of the study of Australian foreign uh, and security policy, and also as a practitioner. Um, he's been involved in diplomacy, intelligence analysis, think tanks, and of course journalism as well. And prior to coming to the NSC, uh, he was uh, the director of the International Security Program uh, at the Lowy Institute from 2007 through to 2015. And before that, uh, of course, he was a uh, senior strategist uh, with the Office of National Assessments. Uh, Ashley Townsend, the co-author uh, to the paper, is a research fellow at the US Studies Center, uh, University of Sydney. Uh, he is, amongst many of the things that he has done, been a research associate in the International Security Program, again at the Lowy Institute uh, from 2010 to 2012. Uh, and uh, a visiting fellow also at SDSC here at ANU. Um, his research uh, focuses mainly on international security and strategic affairs, focusing specifically uh, on China, Northeast Asia, and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Dr. Ewan Graham, uh, who I suppose it could be said, um, took Rory's seat or um, warmed it further uh, at the Lowy Institute, um, uh, is currently the, uh, the Director of International Security uh, at Lowy. Um, and uh, he came there from the very prestigious Rajaratnam School uh, of uh, International Studies at uh, Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. Uh, and he was a senior fellow there, specialising in maritime issues. Um, before that, he was a research analyst uh, in the UK, uh, FCO, and has been uh, charge d'affaires at the British Embassy in Pyongyang, which is a fantastic posting. I, I would like to grill him on his, uh, his experience at some stage. Uh, he is... Uh, a noted researcher uh, on uh, maritime issues, particularly in uh, uh, the East and South China Sea, uh, and uh, remains also an associate fellow uh, at RUSI. Uh, so also extremely well-credentialed panel for you today. Um, copies of this paper are available, and uh, while Ewan will be serving as a discussant for the paper, I don't want to steal any of his thunder, I think it is worth saying at the outset uh, that this is a highly sophisticated piece of analysis, and I'm not just being paid to say that. Um, in fact, uh, I have uh, read it and enjoyed it very much. I think this paper's uh, best contribution is that when you look at the majority of scholarly and uh, policy assessments about Chinese behavior uh, in the Asian maritime region, particularly the South China Sea, there is an inherent assumption that China is simply being assertive. This paper challenges that notion. I think its, uh, its main contribution is that it establishes that there was an initial phase in, in Chinese strategic behavior, in which that was certainly the case. Uh, but now, more recently, it's become apparent that the PRC has drawn back and is participating, to some extent, probably for uh, instrumental reasons, in some of the uh, lower level, behind the scenes architecture that is there to try and moderate conflict. The implication of that, of course, is that it shifts the burden of escalation onto the United States and US allies. And that creates a dilemma for Washington uh, and Washington's friends, partner, friends and partners. 
uh, something that they will have to learn to address. Uh, and I think the other strength of this report is that it identifies going beyond what is normally the case uh, in the literature on this topic, uh, some quite interesting avenues to attempt to moderate Chinese behavior in future. Uh, so with that, uh, I will introduce Rory Med Medcalf, who will talk for about five minutes or so, uh, and then we'll turn to Ashley, uh, then to Ewan to give some thoughts, and uh, we'll take some Q&A. Look, as, as the tensions rise in regional waters, uh, we've tended to assume that there's a risk of war just around the corner, that China's assertive behaviour could accidentally spark war. Uh, my colleague Ashley will talk about this in more detail, but the key message uh, in this paper is that the reality is much more complicated. Certainly, uh, China should not be exonerated from the uh, really the, 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 the affronting nature of the island building that's taken place, uh, which is the manifestation of a great strategic challenge in the region. But at the same time, uh, there's been a fascinating uh, co-option, if I would call it that, of a lot of the rules, the rules for maritime behaviour that only a few years ago we were all encouraging China to engage with and which at that time China was recklessly uh, ignoring. In some ways, the, the key message from this report is that uh, really China is, is abiding by some of the rules in order to challenge or confront or break others. And that makes the, uh, the job of other nations that want to uphold a rules-based order all that more difficult. It puts that burden on us. I'll say a few things about the origin of this report, why we undertook it, why this research has taken place, uh, the context of this for policymakers, and then I'll ask my co-author Ashley Townsend to talk in a bit more detail about the analysis uh, and especially the recommendations, which is the hardest part. Now this report in some ways is the sequel uh, to another report uh, that I worked on at the Lowy Institute some years ago. So we have the new report here, Shifting Waters, that I encourage you all to read. But the sequel, uh, it's the sequel to another report, Crisis and Confidence, with this much more alarming cover uh, that Lowy uh, published five or six years ago, and that I remember very well the then Foreign Minister, uh, Bob Carr, uh, praised very highly at the time, though completely ignored all of its recommendations uh, subsequently, which I suspect was, was a habit uh, of, of Mr Carr's when in, um, when in office. Uh, but that report focused on the really alarming uh, abuse uh, or recklessness that we saw Chinese forces, the Chinese Navy, uh, Coast Guard, other paramilitaries, uh, and really in cahoots with uh, Chinese fishing fleets in pushing out the boundaries of acceptable behaviour and of Chinese authority into the South China Sea, into the East China Sea. And at the time, this did risk war. It did risk escalation. It risked accidental clashes. Uh, there was very poor communication with the navies or coast guards of other countries. Uh, there were all sorts of alarming incidents of Chinese ships harassing uh, the, naval, the naval ships and uh, the air forces of other countries uh, in incidents that could easily have spun out of control. And so the lesson of that report was, frankly, that it was in China's interests to get with the program and start engaging with confidence building measures. The basic Chinese mantra until very recently was this uh, frankly absurd paradox, you have to trust us and we have to trust you before we can talk about confidence building measures to eliminate the risk of war. Precisely the opposite uh, of the, uh, the traditional notion of CBMs that, that helped to keep the, the Cold War cold. Well times have moved on and when we embarked on this project uh, with uh, funding support from the MacArthur Foundation in the United States, I guess my assumption was we'll find more of the same. We will find that China is continuing to break these rules, uh, avoid codes of conduct of behaviour at sea, and I know there's a code of conduct with ASEAN uh, that China is still stalling on, but avoid even basic codes of maritime behaviour for avoiding incidents at sea with the United States and with the Japanese, uh, that China was continuing to use risk as its tactic, as its way of alarming the rest of the region about the possibility of escalation to war and therefore, in a way, creating a cover for the rest of the region to allow China to get on with extending its authority over disputed waters. But what's interesting, uh, and as my colleague Ashley undertook a lot of the face-to-face uh, really -face research interviews behind this report um, over the past two years, what's interesting is that this picture has actually changed in very subtle ways. In fact, uh, it's almost, uh, one almost has to say, be careful what you wish for, because in many ways, China has uh, signed on now to a lot of these 
agreements for uh, unalerted encounters at sea or confidence building measures, channels of communication and behaviour with the United States. And it's done that because, in a sense, um, I suspect at one level the leadership in China has begun to recognise belatedly that the risk of conflict is something China itself can't control, that war is not in China's interests, but also China has already made the gains. It's changed facts on the ground or facts in the water uh, through the island building, through uh, the, the backing down of other countries, the back, the back down of the United States when China essentially seized Scarborough Shoal off the Philippines a few years ago. And so now we're faced with this paradoxical situation as this report outlines in great detail where China is in fact using some of the rules to its advantage to consolidate the gains it made through its reckless uh, ignoring of those rules just a few years ago. Uh, now what this means for us of course uh, is a really difficult set of dilemmas. As the Australian Air Force encountered uh, in some of its patrols through the South China Sea uh, last year, it's continuing patrols that it's undertaken uh, for decades in uh, international airspace. Uh, China is now essentially inventing um, uh, what, what's called military alert zones. We don't know exactly what a military alert zone is. It has no definition uh, under international law or inter international agreements. But chi China is creating quasi-legalistic mechanisms to accuse other countries of being the ones that are disrupting the peace or disrupting good order. And it's doing this to basically protect the gains it's made through uh, illegitimate act activity such as the island building. So a really difficult set of dilemmas for our policymakers and for the United States to deal with. We'll talk a little bit more about the recommendations shortly. Ashley will introduce them to you. Uh, I'm happy to join a conversation about them. Uh, this is, is not a paper that offers all of the solutions. None of the recommendations uh, is without its own, uh, its own problems. This is, I guess, a, a classic wicked problem. Uh, but certainly, if we simply persist with the view that uh, China is breaking all of the rules at sea and we don't acknowledge that it's in fact quite, uh, quite cleverly and cl quite cautiously uh, taking advantage of some of the rules in order to prosecute its claims in the South China Sea, we're only going to have half the story and we'll be further away from a, uh, a viable solution. So I'll leave it there and thank you. Ashley. Uh, thanks, uh, Rory, for that introduction and, um, and everyone for coming to, to hear about the paper today. Um, as tensions rise over Asia's disputed waters, as Rory says, it has become pretty common to assume that China's assertive behavior uh, will accidentally spark uh, an accidental maritime crisis. Uh, but we argue that this view is increasingly out of date. Um, far from escalating the risks for its own, for its own reasons of a confrontation at sea, uh, Chinese military and Coast Guard forces have actually displayed greater professionalism and restraint in recent years. And they have come on board with a range of risk reduction measures and confidence building measures uh, designed to further reduce the risk of a dangerous encounter at sea. Now, it's important to underscore that all of this does bode well for managing maritime tensions without conflict, and that is a good thing. Uh, but China's passive assertive behavior, as we call it, comes with a paradoxical twist. By reducing the risk of dangerous um, air and sea incidents, it's actually become easier for China to embark on strategically provocative activities like island building, the creation of military alert zones, the ADIZ in the East China Sea, and more generally, it's, it's sort of continued expansion of um, maritime, aerial, and, and coast guard patrols across all aspects of maritime Asia. Um, and as these moves aren't aggressive or risky uh, by their own nature, uh, they shift the burden of escalation onto the United States and its partners, making it harder for these countries to push back against China's strategic encroachment. Simply put, uh, China's shift towards a passive assertive strategy makes its ongoing challenge to Asia's maritime status quo less risky and more sustainable, and therefore harder to combat. It wasn't always like this. A few years ago, as Roy's outlined, it, it, Beijing did seem genuinely willing to heighten the risk of a military clash in order to intimidate others into accepting its expansive claims and its new position in the region. Chinese vessels harassed uh, and cut off American warships on several occasions. Aerial incidents uh, or near misses really became quite frequent. There were at least five of these with the US and China in 2014, two between China and Japan. Um, China, and, uh, China also locked its fire control radar on a couple of occasions onto Japanese military assets in the East China Sea. And as Rory outlined as well, there were a number of cases of China essentially using gunboat diplomacy um, to wrestle different features, disputed features from the Philippines, to set up a blockade around Second Thomas Shoal, uh, 
to muscle in with its HS981 oil rig, including sinking some Vietnamese vessels in the process, in an overall coordinated strategy to use tactical recklessness to push out the boundaries of where it existed. But in the last two years, uh, China's tactical aggression has, has genuinely declined. And it's not just us saying that. Uh, a growing chorus of US naval officials uh, have gone on the record, including this, this week, and including our Admiral Harry Harris, who, as you know, has been otherwise very outspoken uh, on China's behavior, they've gone on the record to say that China is being professional and restrained, at least with its naval interactions. Coast Guard interactions um, uh, is more of a mixed bag, but certainly in the East China Sea, China's Coast Guard is behaving in a more professional way vis-a-vis -vis Japan and has actually reduced the frequency of its patrols in the area. Uh, Beijing, importantly, has also changed its tune on maritime confidence building measures. And confidence building measures are essentially rules-based agreements to reduce misperceptions, open up channels of communication during a crisis, and regulate the conduct of opposing ships and aircraft safely. Um, it is these sorts of rules-based CBMs that we focus on in the paper. Um, despite its previous opposition to such measures, Beijing had, uh, did start to negotiate in good faith around 2013, and from 2014, we started to see the fruits of this. Uh, the Code for Unplanned Encounters at Sea was signed, uh, which regulates the interactions of about 21 Asia-Pacific navies, including all the principal players in, in, the maritime, in Asia's maritime disputes. Um, two US-China codes of conduct, as you know, were signed in the last two years, again, to regulate uh, US-China interactions, air and at sea. Um, the important thing is that China has not signed them. It's practiced these measures with regional navies, including Australia, the United States, Indonesia, and other ASEANs. It's also, even more importantly, actually adhered to these guidelines and rules. Um, most notably, in May last year, a, a YouTube video emerged, US Navy filmed, of the Fort Worth in the South China Sea being shadowed in a responsible way by a Chinese guided missile destroyer. And this was one of the first examples of this new um, code of conduct, uh, sorry, this new CBM being used uh, by the Chinese forces. Um, and as I said before, American naval officials have since confirmed this, including in the uh, Asia Pacific Maritime Strategy last year. So the good news in all of this, and there is some good news, is that, uh, is that confidence building measures and China's more restrained tactical conduct um, is contributing to greater tactical stability on the water in maritime Asia. But the more worrying purpose behind China's new aversion to dangerous risk taking um, is what concerns us as well. Um, now that the likelihood of an accidental military crisis is lower, China seems to be emboldened to push ahead with, a, um, with strategically provocative actions that are geared to, to, to redrawing Asia's maritime boundaries. Island building in the South China Sea is the centerpiece of this strategy. Uh, the establishment of these far-flung outposts right throughout the Spratly, Paracel, and perhaps soon the Scarborough Shoal in the South China Sea um, will give China an outsized capacity to tilt the military balance in its favor, at least in certain conditions. Um, once, once these outposts are all, if they are, equipped with um, military-grade airstrips, but also forward-deployed fighters, um, ballistic missiles, air defense missiles, and perhaps an air defense identification zone to regulate all of this, China will have altered the status quo in the region. And perhaps, as, as Rory and, uh, and another Lowy colleague argued in a previous paper, perhaps also be able to use the South China Sea as a bastion for its nuclear submarines in time. Um, instead of using reckless naval maneuvers to intimidate nearby vessels or chase away the US and other Southeast Asian navies, China has turned to these radio warnings um, to warn other countries, warn the Australian Air Force as well, to avoid moving into China's military alert zones or face unspecified consequences, uh, presumably of a military nature, but a, but a covert threat um, that has not yet led to tactical crises. Uh, likewise, China's air defense um, zone in the East China Sea is another non-confrontational way to alter the, uh, the uh, to, to deter um, countries from exercising freedom of navigation in what, is, what are international waters, um, to chip away at that norm, and to challenge the administrative status quo, uh, principally over the Senkaku Diayo Islands. Um, many Chinese analysts themselves talk about an ADIZ as a way of ensuring up Chinese spheres of influence. Um, I think also uh, another thing to point out is that China has stepped up um, Navy and Air Force controls right throughout the South China Sea but more importantly undertaken quite sophisticated military exercises in recent years, including one last year, which was the largest to date in the South China Sea, over 100 warships, dozens of planes, 
in including the Chinese uh, nuclear forces, uh, the second artillery, now um, renamed the rocket force. Um, so all of these activities are designed to gradually change China's maritime status quo without triggering an accidental military crisis. Uh, because they don't require dangerous tactics to be successful, China feels more confident about using them to shore up its advantage and more confident that other nations will find it difficult to stop them. So there are four main implications of this passive assertiveness that I'm going to run through before we look at some recommendations. Um, China's maritime tensions are now being better managed, but they aren't being solved. Um, so all of these agreements that we've seen to date in China's behavior is geared around uh, preventing escalation, preventing uh, encounters to go out of control. But no country, not least China, has been willing to actually genuinely negotiate or compromise more on any of the underlying causes for maritime disagreements. For instance, the sovereignty claims, the difference in opinion over what an exclusive economic zone actually means. The US, Japan, China um, are, in a sense, still disagreed on these points. Um, and so the reason, the driver, for ships and aircraft to operate in close proximity in tense environments is still there. But these things are being managed. So it's a mixed bag there. Second implication is that China is using tactical stability uh, quite deliberately, it seems, to strengthen its strategic position. Um, it appears that Beijing has calculated the best way to expand and consolidate the strategic presence that it has been building over the past five or so years has been to take the risk of conflict out of the equation. This is why uh, China has felt emboldened to pursue the sorts of passive assertive activities that we discuss. Um, moreover, I think Chinese analysts and officials um, have, have, have privately said that they think CBMs will limit and restrain other countries in their responses. They see CBMs as a, as a two-way street, a way, for actually, um, a way for actually making it more difficult for other countries to seize the initiative in responding tactically to China's provocations. Um, so thirdly then, the burden of escalation is shifting to the US and its uh, Asian allies and partners. Um, now the US faces the dilemma. It must either watch on as Asia's maritime order uh, starts to erode and change, or it must itself assume some of the costs and risks uh, for escalation. China's island building, the expansion of ADIZs, etc., won't by themselves cause a crisis. It's only our response uh, that will cause a potential crisis if there is one, and China is banking on that to actually expand and consolidate these features on the water. And then fourthly, a, a public relations uh, war is unfolding over maritime risk taking. Uh, this is something that you know, it may not seem uh, as important as the strategic reality there, but it is a corollary of China's strategy. Um, China has stepped up its public relations efforts to portray the United States as the principal um, antagonist, maritime risk taker in the region, um, and also has brought in its accusations of um, other countries stirring up trouble and, and, and leveled them at Australia, Japan, and others. Um, it's about changing the narrative. And while many countries won't be fooled by this, China is already lining up its, its, its side of the international debate on these issues by bringing Russia, uh, some Southeast Asian countries, to align with its view on the upcoming case in the uh, Philippines versus China Tribunal. Well, um, it's also important that if this international narrative is muddied, it may make it difficult for global bodies to speak out by naming China directly, and it certainly makes it difficult for smaller and, and more concerned Southeast Asian countries to themselves saddle up with a, a United States or an Australian and Japanese response that maybe then cause them to be labeled as, as provocateurs. So finally, a couple of recommendations. Uh, we look at four clusters of recommendations. I'm just going to touch on three here, and there's a, a number of different details in each of them. Uh, regional maritime players should strengthen and expand rules-based CBMs. I think uh, a key takeaway from this report is that despite everything, CBMs do appear to be working, despite the fact that China is co-opting them to its advantage as well. Um, but CBMs uh, have not yet uh, run their full course. We are missing dedicated China-Japan and China-ASEAN measures, and indeed China is deliberately stalling on the code of conduct in the South China Sea, it seems to most observers. Uh, but Coast Guards also need to be brought into the equation. Although there's a tacit agreement between China and Japan, um, the United States now is pushing hard for China to bring its Coast Guard um, into the Q's agreement to all US-China MOUs, as other Southeast Asians like Singapore have argued. This is important because Coast Guards now account for the majority of 
encounters, including risky encounters uh, in the South China Sea in particular. Secondly, uh, countries do need to push back against China's um, creeping strategic expansion, um, but in a pragmatic and cautious way. And the ways that they do that won't all be the same. Uh, countries do need to exercise their right to freedom of navigation in newly contested waters um, in their own ways. For some, like Australia, this will be to maintain our quiet approach of exercising our right to freedom of navigation rather than undertaking dedicated FONOPs. Uh, but for smaller Southeast Asian countries with political reasons for not wanting to do this, or even for the lack of capacity in order, in order to do this, um, they may want to take the Philippines lead and offer open, open or offer um, their territories, their bases and ports and airstrips uh, for the United States or other countries to launch patrols or even FONOPs from there. That is certainly something China is uh, not wanting to see. Um, I think, though, in the pushback, one key point in this paper is that it's important to shift, to, uh, to shift our mentality, not to think about responding to China's passive assertiveness, but actually to think about deterring China's future militarization. I think too much uh, attention is focused on responsiveness, and, and in truth, there is no direct response to the creation of islands. There's certainly no military solution. Uh, so in, in thinking about a deterrence framework, uh, I think it's important um, to talk about uh, privately communicating red lines to China around the question of militarization of the Spratleys in particular, uh, and also of the establishment of an ADIZ. Uh, rather than shifting to more frequent or, or, or more provocative font ops, perhaps not under innocent passage now, it makes sense to use these as leverage to try and seize back the initiative uh, from China and deter them from doing something that we, we, we don't want to see change the region. And finally, um, countries do need to expand diplomatic and legal efforts to pressure China. I think uh, it's often underestimated. Uh, people often argue that reputational costs don't matter to Beijing. I think that they do. Um, China is becoming increasingly allergic, I think, to international reputation, uh, reputational damage, public criticisms by countries like the United States and Australia, but also global bodies like the G7 and the EU. Um, and that's partially why it's trying to, again, line up its side of the equation with countries that support its view on all of these issues. Um, quite interestingly, in the course of this, uh, this research, it's become clear to me that a growing number of Chinese analysts argue that, that, Beijing's, um, that Beijing's policy is counterproductive. And actually, they point to the fact that Australia's criticism, international advocacy on this issue, and the more generally ratcheting up of diplomatic criticism that Australian government has done over the past year, is actually something they observe. It's almost a barometer for how they're losing the region, a barometer for how the China threat theory is starting to come back in vogue. Um, so with that, I think um, we'll leave it there. There are more recommendations uh, in the paper, and we can discuss these in, in the Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'll keep my comments very brief, because I know that I stand between you, the audience, who've um, come here today, and uh, your opportunity to put some questions directly to the authors. Um, so. It, I'd just like to say, first of all, that um, I very much welcome this as a joint um, Lowy Institute National Security College launch. This was a, a project which had its genesis um, when my distinguished predecessor was still in the Lowy Institute. That baton now has been carried, um, and um, hopefully it's the beginning of a, a, a fruitful partnership ahead, because um, we, uh, we, we have an overlap in what we do, but we also have um, also our, our distinct differences. The fact that we are in Sydney too, I welcome the fact that we um, probably need to be doing more in Canberra in future as well. There are policy recommendations as Ashley has already uh, made clear to this and I think having a policy, um, uh, I know several people in uniform in the audience, um, there is of course uh, implications for, for Australia in this as well as for a, a general um, Indo-Pacific wide readership. Um, let me also congratulate both of the authors on an extremely uh, well-researched, very detailed, very timely uh, analysis. Uh, it couldn't be more timely in many ways. Although the South China Sea has continued to be on the boil, uh, I think we are in a, a new and in intense phase, particularly this year, um, bookmarked by um, US freedom of navigation operations on one hand, uh, a legal case with the Philippines in which we're expecting a decision soon, and of course the US election uh, politically uh, at the end of the year, um, which obviously is part of um, China's calculus. Uh, I would also echo the, the broad conclusion, which um, both the, uh, the um, authors have already flagged, 
uh, and which um, Matt Sussex in his introduction also echoed, which is this, um, although we're looking in, in very granular terms in, throughout the paper uh, at sort of operational and tactical details, to me it, it, it speaks to this paradox of our region, uh, the, the wider uh, Indo-Pacific, where we have uh, on the one hand the good news story of an unparalleled peace between states, which other regions in the world look at with envy, but on the other hand, uh, the ongoing simmering and apparently irreconcilable rivalries between larger states, which seems to be pushing in, in a much, uh, towards a much sort of uh, darker and potentially uh, foreboding future. So there is a strategic question, I think, that, that subtlety, that distinction, uh, which, although we're looking in very detailed granular terms, as I say, I think it, uh, it, it, it brings that nuance uh, into clear light. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I was in Singapore previously, and we had there, I think, a, a, a real focus on this question of conflict avoidance, which of course is important. CBMs um, are worth the, uh, the candle, um, but they're not a panacea. Uh, it's not the only thing, and simply avoiding conflict doesn't uh, magic away the, the strategic um, questions, uh, particularly if there is intent behind them uh, to challenge the status quo. So I think in that uh, wider sense, uh, this is um, an extremely uh, sharp piece of, uh, of well-argued analysis uh, with over 200 footnotes. Um, there is no shortage of, uh, of information there, and I, I uh, commend it to you highly for those with an interest, uh, as I have in the maritime security domain, um, that um, it's uh, part of a debate that will no doubt uh, run and we at the Lowy Institute will continue to keep our focus on this and, uh, and similar issues. So um, I'll conclude my comments there and be very happy to take your questions with the other panelists. Broughton Robertson, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, thank you very much for um, this useful contribution to the, the debate, um, the discussion. Uh, just a couple of very quick questions. One, um, you did make an oblique reference to it, but, but China, its passive assertiveness has certainly been demonstrated recently um, with Coast Guard vessels escorting uh, convoys of fishing boats uh, in Malaysian and Indonesian uh, waters. Um, I wonder if you've got any comments about what the purpose of that is, is it testing their resolve, etc. And secondly, on CBMs, if you've got anything to add on how international law could be used further, perhaps. Obviously there's the, the Philippine arbitration um, and China's position on that is very well known. China refuses to clarify what the nine dash line means, although there are sometimes references to um, to four uh, ocean archipelagos, but uh, any any further ideas on how international law could be used to 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 um, to, to deal with this issue? Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, Broughton. That's um, they're they're uh, all very pertinent questions. I think on the first question about the Coast Guard uh, convoys, the uh, one distinction that we make in the paper is between the behaviour of navies and the behaviour of Coast Guards and the other auxiliary law enforcement and frankly paramilitary forces uh, that China's been increasingly using. Now China, I, I think one of the opportunities for other countries on this issue, we're seeing China, as I say, abide by some rules in order to break others. Uh, we now need to call out China on the inconsistencies between the fact that it is being more rule abiding in its naval behaviour uh, and in some ways less rule abiding in the behaviour of coast guards and auxiliaries. The, the, the essentially forceful intervention into uh, Indonesia's uh, lawful apprehension of uh, illegal Chinese fishing in Indonesian waters recently by a, China, a very powerful Chinese coast guard vessel is a perfect example of where China is, is clearly uh, abusing the rules or, or uh, not following the rules. So we, I think uh, there needs to be international pressure on China to pursue, uh, quickly move towards uh, confidence building measures uh, and rules relating to the Coast Guard and the other auxiliaries so that this massive loophole in the naval uh, rule abiding uh, nature of Chinese behaviour can be, can be dealt with. Uh, and I think in a way the fact that China is now adhering to some rules gives us an opportunity to call China out on the blatant inconsistency, uh, inconsistency there. On the, uh, the related matter of uh, how do we use international law to try and limit uh, the affronting nature of China's behaviour more generally, the paper also makes the case, uh, it encourages uh, strong support for uh, 
a uh, essentially a rules-based ap approach to the Philippines, China, uh, uh, territorial differences, and indeed uh, strong international consensus uh, in support of whatever the uh, the outcome, the verdict is of the arbitration case uh, that that lies ahead. Uh, that, of course, is perhaps a forlorn hope, uh, but it points to this. Uh, this, I guess, opening that China's now given us to call it out on inconsistencies in its application of the rules. Uh, at least China's now no longer saying we don't accept all of the rules. Uh, I'll go to you, Ash. Uh, just two uh, quick points to add on that. <clears throat> on, on, on international law, one thing we, we, we do talk a little bit about is uh, reducing the ability of China to argue that there is a genuine debate around UNCLOS and what it means for exclusive economic zones. Obviously, we echo the call of many that the United States um, and Congress should sign UNCLOS. But other than that, um, more efforts, uh, sorry, to ratify UNCLOS, but, but more efforts um, by the United States and other countries like Australia to get US allies and partners in the region to also come on board with the dominant understanding of UNCLOS would be important. Countries like um, Vietnam, Malaysia, even the Philippines and India have somewhat different views to the United States and Australia on what's permissible under UNCLOS. Bringing those countries into line, uh, and others if possible, would, would make it harder for China to argue that there is a legitimate argument here. On Coast Guards, um, I agree with, with Rory's comments. Um, I would just add one thing, which is that um, Coast Guards in the South China Sea their behaviour has changed a little bit in a way that suggests they are becoming less aggressive tactically vis-a-vis -vis other government ships. We have seen and continue to see the use of water cannons, arrests, flares, etc. against fishing boats, but China hasn't undertaken coordinated strategies uh, of its Coast Guard and fishing boats to harass, sink or ram other Coast Guards since the HS981 oil rig incident. Or if it has, these have been underreported and, and very few by comparison. And in the East China Sea, Coast Guards have become very restrained, um, which brings us to a larger point we haven't touched on yet today, which is all of the passive assertiveness tendencies that we see are more fully developed vis-a-vis -vis the US and Japan. China worries a lot more about escalation with these major powers than with smaller Southeast Asian countries that it feels it can intimidate without risk. Um, I'll just add my part on the fishing vessels, which I think is a very uh, pertinent question uh, because of the incidents that have happened recently, uh, both in uh, around Indonesian waters near Natuna Island, uh, but also within uh, Malaysia's EZ off, um, off East Malaysia and, and Sarawak. Um, there is a question, uh, an open question, about what the level of government direction is behind um, China's fishing fleets. Uh, it may be too simple to leap to the conclusion that it is simply a, a proxy. Um, to my mind, there is a, an unhealthy um, spiral also involved in which the denuding of fishing stocks in South China Sea is inherently pushing fishing vessels from China to go further out. Uh, and whether directed or not, to do the work of the creeping jurisdiction um, that uh, lies behind, I think, a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the government directive. Um, but at the, at the, other, um, uh, the other aspect of this is, um, as Ashley had said, I mean, incidents may not all be reported. Um, we have to rely on, on public database, but there is, I think, an, an open question to be asked if we're looking particularly at Southeast Asian countries that are seeking to maintain a healthy bilateral relationship with China, they may have an active disincentive to publicly reporting uh, incidents that are ongoing involving um, fishing vessels and, and maritime law, law enforcement. G'day, Nick Stewart from the Canberra Times. Thanks very much for that. Uh, the, uh, there's been um, satellite imagery that suggests that there might be another uh, island building uh, activity about to take place. Uh, firstly, do you think that perhaps diplomatic pressure that's been exerted in Beijing at the moment has prevented that uh, so far? Uh, and secondly, what would that mean if it does actually take place? Would, would that be a reassertion of the uh, aggressive side or, or is it just another play, another step in building the, the Great Wall? Thanks. Um, Greg Raymond at um, STSC. Thanks, uh, Rory, you and, 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 um, and Ashley for it, what sounds like a, a fantastic paper that I'm really looking forward to reading. Um, just two quick questions. 
first of all, I'm interested in your point that uh, the burden of escalation has been shifted to uh, uh, other powers, or, or, or I guess to uh, allied powers, the US, Australia and so forth. Uh, given that um, uh, now it would seem that FONOPS would be safer uh, if there is going to be less challenge from uh, the Chinese maritime forces, and also isn't it up to China now to enforce any ADIs or maritime uh, military enforcement zone? Won't the burden be on them to actually and try to enforce those zones? The other question is, uh, does your paper cover any of the economic uh, dimensions of this issue? We tend to look at the strategic issues somewhat in a stovepipe, but I think it's probably true to say that for policymakers here, at least in Australia and other countries, our voice on China, our preparedness to criticise, our preparedness to call out the Nine Dash Line has been somewhat muted by our economic stakes in the relationship. And I'm just wondering if the paper covers those. Thank you. Um, Dougal Robinson from DFAT. Look, it's been known for a long time that Pacific Command has wanted Australia to do more. There are some in Washington, like Australia's Andrew Shearer, calling for sort of federated defence between the US, Japan and Australia, and that view seems to be gaining traction in Washington. At the same time, it looks like any credible future US administration would probably tend more towards competition rather than collaboration in the relationship with China. So on that basis, how, how do you see that playing out for Australia and how does this paper and yourselves projecting forward think that that's going to resolve itself from Canberra's point of view come January 2017 when we have a new US president? I might work backwards, uh, starting with Dougal. I liked your term, credible US administration. Um, yeah, I think we can interpret that in various ways. Uh, look, I think the, um, the paper doesn't go specifically to what, what are the specific coalitions that should take action. Uh, and again, I think when this paper was a joint effort, we may each have our own um, slightly different views on this. My own view is that... Um, is that uh, Australia should, I mean, Australia has its own very good reasons for upholding freedom of navigation uh, in the South China Sea, either unilaterally or in partnership with others, including but not exclusively with the United States. So I do think the diplomatic challenge for us is still how do we get our message across without giving any false impression or being open to the accusation that we're just doing it because the Americans want us to. Uh, and that's only going to be a more acute problem if uh, there's a certain administration next year as opposed to another one. Um, but I, I think that doesn't mean we shouldn't do partnership with the Americans. We should do both. We should do our own unilateral activities and from time to time work in concert with the Americans or the Japanese <coughs> or others uh, in the South China Sea. Um, I think. It goes to the more general question, uh, I, think, uh, I think it was Greg's questions about, um, uh, about risk and freedom of, freedom of navigation operations. And I think you make a very good point when you say that, in fact, if China is, um, less in is actually more worried about escalation than it used to be, uh, that it, it actually means that although they may challenge our freedom, freedom of navigation operations, there is actually a built-in disincentive for them to follow through on threats. Uh, of course, we don't want to get into a game of um, who's going to lose face first and how do we uh, humiliate the China le Chinese leadership as much as possible in front of the Chinese population because we don't know how, how that will end. Uh, I think on balance, though, it's fair to say that the Chinese leadership um, is trying to manage risk rather than uh, manufacture risk as much as possible. It's exploited our fear of escalation over the past few years very, very effectively. But it's reached a point now where, it's, where it is playing a more sophisticated, sophisticated game. And I think particularly FONOPs or other activities that are not advertised dramatically in advance uh, and where the, I guess, the humiliation factor isn't the name of the game, it's the it's the precedent or it's the maintenance of the existing status quo where we have exerted uh, exercise free freedom of navigation for many years. That's the priority. So I think what I would encourage is uh, more activity, more Australian activity, uh, but do it with a reasonably low profile and perhaps only announce it after the, uh, after the event. Uh, the paper doesn't look at great length on the economic dimensions of this. I would echo, I think, Ewan's point about fishing. I think uh, a colleague here at the National Security College, uh, Marina Tserbus has written a very interesting recent article online about how 
internationalising the fishing issue and the overfishing and the depletion of fisheries in the South China Sea is perhaps now one of the best and most sensible avenues for us to pursue in, uh, in limiting China's behaviour and trying to, to basically encourage China to be a bit more genuinely self-interested because it's going to be a, a great tragedy if China essentially uh, finally manages to exert uh, the maximum of authority over uh, the economic uses of the South China Sea only to, define, to find that fishing stocks there have basically been uh, eliminated. And the island building, of course, is accelerating uh, that, that sorry outcome. Uh, and going finally to your point, um, I think, Nick, on, uh, on Scarborough Shoal and on the, the new phases of the island building, I don't think the island building has been stop-start in response to diplomatic pressure. It's just continued pretty relentlessly. And I, I mean, it is a difficult distinction that we make in this paper. Uh, the island building is occurring precisely because, in, in a way, uh, China has uh, co-opted or changed the rules around risk. So it feels in a way that the island building is a very, uh, you know, some American colleagues will disagree with this, but a very passive way of uh, extending authority because each stage of island building isn't uh, causing an immediate risk of conflict. Whereas in the past, ramming ships, sending uh, the Navy out into confrontations was doing that. So I'm afraid to say we're likely to see more of the same and we're likely therefore to see uh, these very difficult decisions of how do we make, we collectively take decisions to confront China, uh, we, we see that or I see that as the, the dynamic that will continue to be at work. Uh, the only other thing we haven't mentioned about this paper is it talks about looking for oblique or other ways to put pressure on China. And perhaps uh, in the end the only way for countries like Australia and others in the region to put pressure on China will be to be willing to bear economic costs ourselves uh, in the degree to which we're willing to confront. That's going to be tough. Sorry, I've taken a lot of your time there, actually. <laughs> no problem. Um, I'll quickly one, run through the three questions. Um, uh, on, on Nick, on your question, um, I agree with, uh, with Rory's point there. It's difficult, to, it's difficult to actually draw out a specific tit-for-tat relationship on China's actions in the South China Sea vis-a-vis -vis US counter-reactions. I think although it seems clear that over a period of years there's a general cycle of escalation from the pivot to island building, et cetera, looking for specific responses to specific provocations, I've tried to find that and I haven't found it. China's island building is continuing uh, <coughs> despite everything. Um, on, on Scarborough Shoal though, specifically, um, I think two points. Um, one is I don't think that it's been prevented by diplomatic pressure. I think that it's obviously the probably the, mo the more uh, difficult one for China to build on, precisely because it has taken on enhanced significance by the way China actually got control of the maritime space around it back in 2012. Um, it, was one of the, it was the only feature that was directly wrestled, in fact, from Philippine uh, jurisdiction and Philippine control through the overt, or covert at least, uh, threat of the use of force. Um, so how the US wants to back Philippines on this issue is, what, is what's important to watch. Were the US to come forward as they did over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands to say this is covered by the treaty, I think that would be a muscular uh, uh, way for Washington to try and deter building there. And secondly, if, if building uh, did occur after the tribunal, I think it will be interpreted as an act of defiance against the UN tribunal. Um, if, if Beijing were trying to, um, if Beijing wanted to build on the Scarborough Shoal, uh, it would be best to build before the tribunal rather than afterwards, because there will be a lot more flack on that. And there's a sense of moral hazard in the tribunal, much like a ceasefire agreement where rebel sides try to get as much as they can before the agreement comes into force. China might try and build as much as it can before it becomes more diplomatically harder to do so. Uh, Greg, on the question of um, burden of escalation shifting, I wrestled with this idea of our FONOPs getting safer because China's less likely to want to challenge them provocatively. And I think the answer is yes, but. Um, FONOPs, the US FONOPs to date have been uh, the least provocative way they could be undertaken under innocent passage. China's response has also been tactically restrained. Uh, and interestingly, it's been the United States not China, that has leaked every incidence 
uh, of challenges to its maritime jurisdictions, the, or, or British journalists at the BBC on Australia's overflight. China hasn't got an incentive to publicize other countries challenging it there. Um, so it is trying to keep FONOPS in check, and that goes to Rory's point of not actually using FONOPS to publicly humiliate China, um, but telling them that we might do so in the future if they do things that we really don't want, like militarization or aid is construction. Um, but, the, but the but of that response is that we don't know how a more forceful FONOP uh, policy by any country, including Australia, could actually change the calculus in China. We don't want to rely too much on these measures, even though we see that they are working. And that's, again, part of China's strategy for using them. But more importantly, perhaps, is we don't know what might tilt the debate within the PLA and within the Chinese administration to quickening the pace of militarization and putting things, putting ships and, and other uh, forward deployed air force missiles, et cetera, there sooner rather than later. How much faster than later? How much faster? <laughs> right. Um, but they could do things more permanently and they probably could, could deploy forces by the end of the year according to US intelligence estimates. They haven't done that yet and there is a debate within China about is this all going too far and are we losing control of what we want to achieve here? Um, moderation, therefore, gives time for those internal debates to maybe stick. And finally, on the point of, of, of PACOM wanting Australia to do more, I would make one point there, which is that PACOM might want Australia to do more, but it's not necessarily the case that the White House wants Australia to do more yet. So that debate within the United States um, is also interesting. Um, to the extent that I think Australia should consider getting involved in FONOPS, I think that it's important we don't just, as I said before, use them as a response, but think about them carefully in a tailored deterrence framework where they might actually have more traction. Um, Australia, could take, Australia could say that it will take part publicly in US FONOPS as a potential response to future militarization. That would be more important than just doing it because America wants us to. So letting states respond to Chinese challenges in their own ways is also useful for um, for showing China that this is an organic regional aversion to what it's doing, not a US directed policy to contain China. Um, as the non author on the panel, I, I, I don't think I should do the author's jobs and represent the, um, the uh, analysis for them. So I'll just restrict my comments to Scarborough Shoal because um, when I said that this is very timely, this is obviously one area where I think for, um, attentions, the focus of the US in particular, is, is going increasingly towards as the next um, potential focal point or, or flashpoint in the South China Sea. Um, speaking to a lot of the issues that have been raised in the uh, analysis, um, but to emphasize that Scarborough Shoal is different, as Ashley said, because it was a, it was a, a, uh, a change of the status quo. I mean, um, sovereignty can be disputed, but uh, the Philippines was the de facto administrator there. Scarborough Shoal is geographically in a very different location. To It's not part of the Spratleys. It's a freestanding feature far to the north. It's in a particularly strategic location in terms of extending air cover, if that's what China's military um, strategy is, is about, further into the north of the South China Sea. And it lies fully within um, Philippines' exclusive economic zone, which is not challenged by any other feature that even by a maximalist interpretation could, could legally... Um, do so. so. So from that point of view, I think it would be a very significant escalation if China were to do that. And if, uh, if Ashley's right and, and it makes more sense to do it ahead of the ruling, we may see something happen very soon because that ruling may happen as early as, as the end of May. It may go a little bit longer, but it'll probably be around the middle of the year. Um, so that's one to watch. And just to connect with the freedom of, nav with freedom of navigation operations, this certainly gets to the limitation of freedom of navigation operations. They uh, are not about changing the status um, quo physically. Um, Ashley's point is well taken that where they leave off and deterrence starts, I think, is something the US is, is thinking very hard about. But the purpose of, of uh, any activity about, around Scarborough Shoal would be to deter further um, land building activity. So it, by, in, by definition, it has to serve a, a deterrent function. Simply sailing past is not going to uh, change anything. It would be something rather rather different, I think, if it were to happen. Um, my question is about the uh, submarine deal. What's, <laughs> what's the implication of, of this deal to, to China and to the South, South, uh, South China Sea situation? How long have you got? Can I go first? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. 
you and I bet you want to say something on this. Yeah, and look, I'll give my own view. I mean, I think there is an absolute nonsense being peddled in some media uh, that the Australian decision on the submarine deal was due to Chinese pressure, uh, and I think uh, that's you know that's a really uh, it's quite insulting uh, nonsense that's been peddled in some of the uh, some of the media coverage. So I think uh, I think the first the, the key point to make in this is. Uh, is it a low? I mean, personally, I think uh, that Australia should continue to deepen its strategic partnership with Japan, and obviously, uh, a Japanese uh, win in the submarine uh, competitive evaluation process and selection would have been, uh, you know, a major step in that direction. There are still lots Australia and Japan can do together, and there'll be some hard work ahead to reassure Japan on that front uh, by my Australian colleagues. But the fundamental point is that Australia is very serious about building up its naval deterrence, its maritime deterrence, submarines will be at the centre of that. And so basically, no matter where the submarines come from, as long as they're in the view of Australian capability uh, planners, the best submarines for us, uh, that's a pretty significant message uh, to China and other countries in the region that Australia is going to be a serious partner in coalitions to manage uh, the regional the regional order. Uh, I think that's all I'll say on that. Um, I'd agree with everything that um, Rory has said, but just add that I think, as well as the unhelpful external myth that this is deference to uh, China that has um, driven the decision to award to France instead of Japan, there is also an internal myth which is fast growing up that this is not about strategy at all, it's about South Australia uh, and, and seats in an election to come forward. And, and I've, I find that's interesting that you, you have these two myths, in some ways re reflecting the wider discourses uh, about Australia's positioning between the United States and China in its, in its diplomacy. But within Australia too, the de defence debate can be very parochial at times. And this, this latter myth, I think, is... Uh, something that is also it's a reflection back of that, that, that people are looking inwards at defence and, and perhaps it's unavoidable in an election year, but it shouldn't mask the fact that the, that the decision to double the submarine fleet is a very significant one. It's strategically driven at its core. And if it's fully funded and carried out, I say if because we've been somewhere down this road before, things can happen technically, but nonetheless, the decision and, and the white paper has put um, numbers behind this for the first time to double the submarine fleet will end up with uh, you know a very much more capable submarine force uh, and that's something I, I think a strategic signal that is, is loud and clear uh, regardless of whether they have a, a made in France label or a made in Japan label. One last thought. I think the best submarine decision for Australia from a Chinese perspective would have been to buy none at all. Uh, and so I think, uh, I think that's been categorically uh, squashed.